Buenas tardes y sean bienvenidos todos. En primer lugar, quisiera darle la bienvenida a este monumento tan emblemático para Occidente como es la Mezquita Catedral de Córdoba. Del mismo modo, quisiera aprovechar la oportunidad para agradecerle su participación en este acto de inauguración de la decimoséptima jornada de la Sociedad Erz Genfert. Los próximos días concentrarán en nuestra ciudad a los mayores especialistas, investigadores, arqueólogos, historiadores del arte, filólogos, etc., en todo lo relativo a la arqueología y el arte del Islam, bajo el denominador común de las mezquitas, sus antecedentes, su fundación y su transformación. Se definirán los objetivos en los que se centrará la reunión, que no son otros que la revisión del conocimiento que existe acerca de las mezquitas, su evolución histórica y la comparación entre modelos pertenecientes a diferentes realidades geográficas. Y en este marco se va a encuadrar la presentación de los últimos datos obtenidos en las intervenciones arqueológicas y en la restauración en la Mezquita Catedral de Córdoba. Datos que aportan mayor complejidad y riqueza a la evolución de este edificio, alejándolo de interpretaciones simples que cercenan su historia y su importancia para toda la humanidad. Un edificio que cobija en su interior más misterio que belleza, sin igual que nos enseña y que día a día nos desvela su grandeza como elemento principal en la historia del arte, la arquitectura y cuantos conocimientos integran el saber de los hombres. Por lo tanto, ese proceso que ahora iniciamos, que supone compartir lo investigado y descubierto en torno a estos fascinantes edificios, debía contar con el apoyo de la institución que presido, el Cabildo Catedral, custodio de uno de los mejores ejemplos conservados, acaso el mayor de los que son y suponen para la humanidad este tipo de edificios, unos edificios singulares, que en nuestro caso hemos sabido mantener, respetar y dar esplendor durante ocho siglos para que continúe con el uso para el que fue creado, que no es otro que el de la oración y la admiración por su belleza. Muchas gracias a todos. Damos la palabra al señor alcalde. Bueno, muy buenas tardes. Saludar respetuosamente al señor Deán, presidente del Cabildo de esta Catedral de Córdoba, don Manuel, al presidente de la, socia de la sociedad Ed Harfer, a Fernando Valdés, a la conferenciante, y sobre todo darle la bienvenida a todos ustedes a este encuentro que van a desarrollar en esta maravillosa ciudad de Córdoba. En Córdoba tenemos la suerte de contar con un inmenso legado patrimonial e histórico reconocido en cuatro ocasiones por la UNESCO con ese reconocimiento de patrimonio de la humanidad o patrimonio mundial, como prefieran llamarlo. Pero si esa es algo valioso, si es algo que tenemos claro que es una palanca en la cual o un espejo en el cual mirarnos, también tenemos la certeza de que debemos continuar, no solo con el legado patrimonial de conservación y de cuidado, sino dando una interpretación, una investigación y un carácter científico a todo lo que ha supuesto la aportación de Córdoba en el conjunto del desarrollo de las civilizaciones y de la humanidad. Por eso, cuando por parte de Fernando Valdés, de la asociación que también vino de Amigos de Medina Zahara, se nos presentó el proyecto para albergar este congreso, lo acogimos con alegría, igual que hoy acogemos con orgullo el que se pueda celebrar, porque permite actualizar conocimientos, profundizar en investigaciones y, sobre todo, nos permite reivindicar el papel que Córdoba desempeña en España, en Europa y en el mundo a lo largo de nuestra historia, pero también en la actualidad como un centro de conocimiento, como un centro de congresos y de investigación. Además, no me cabe la menor duda, porque así nos lo han expresado vuestros representantes, de que ha tenido mucho que ver 
la elección de la ciudad de Córdoba para la celebración de esta jornada, con la labor de investigación que se está desarrollando aquí mismo, en el patio de los naranjos, donde se está haciendo un excelente trabajo por parte del Cabildo, que dirige, pero sobre todo cuida esta catedral y le da realce, un trabajo de investigación que creo que puede aportarle a sus conocimientos, a sus conclusiones, a su labor también de difusión, en este caso centrada precisamente en el desarrollo de las mezquitas a lo largo de la historia. Estoy convencido de que van a tener una oportunidad única de admirar ese patrimonio, también de poder observar en vivo y en directo esa investigación antes de que deba volver a guardarse con el debido cuidado nuestro patrimonio que está en el patio de los naranjos. Por tanto, estaremos muy atentos a las publicaciones que se hagan de este congreso en la revista de la sociedad para no saber cuáles son sus conclusiones, que ya sé que no se trata de conclusiones, pero sí saber cuáles son sus posturas, cuáles son sus investigaciones, cuáles son sus ponencias en todo lo relativo a, a, la, a las mezquitas y en concreto lo que nos pueda atañer a Córdoba para seguir tratando de mejorar en la labor que en la ciudad de Córdoba hacemos pues entre todos la que hace el Cabildo, la que hace el Ayuntamiento y, sobre todo, la que hacemos colaborando entre todos nosotros. Espero que, además, puedan disponer de tiempo para también disfrutar del resto del patrimonio de esta maravillosa ciudad y que se vayan encantados de la misma. Muchísimas gracias. Señoras y señores, damas y caballeros, ladies and gentlemen, no habla el español, Uh, I wish to thank in English to express my gratitude uh, of, uh, in the name of the Ernst Herzfeld Society for Studies in Islamic Art and Archaeology. As the chairman of the society, it is a scholarly and academic society with members from all across Europe, including Spain, from Islamic countries, Arab countries, and from other places of the world. The conference or the colloquium uh, on the mosque in transformation, which starts tomorrow, is organized on behalf of the society. Uh, we have such conference colloquium every year, each time in another place on another theme. Last year we have been in Rome, in Italy, before in Berlin and Germany, Budapest in Hungary, Vienna in Austria, Zurich in Switzerland, to name just a few of these places. It is the first time that the Ernst Herzfeld Society is uh, in Cordoba and uh, has a conference here, and we are deeply grateful that this is possible Uh, and we are deeply grateful that it is possible to start this evening with a lecture in such an extraordinary and spectacular place in the Mezquita Catedral of Córdoba. The Society wishes to thank the people and the institutions who made this possible. First of all, the president of the cathedral chapter, Señor Deán Presidente del Cabildo, de la Catedral de Córdoba, Manuel Pérez Moya, who allowed and even suggested to start the conference with a lecture in this wonderful place. We wish to thank the mayor of the city, Señor Alcalde de Córdoba, José María Belido Roche, who helped to organize and to stage the event in Córdoba. We thank the director of the Casa Arabe, Senor Javier Rosson, who offered a most uh, pleasant and delightful place for the conference itself, the Casa Arabe, from tomorrow. And we would like to thank the Madam President, Presidenta de la Asociación de Amigos de Medina Azahara, Ana Zamorano, who supported, supports uh, the entire event. And we wish to thank all those who helped uh, in front of the scene, behind the scene, in one or the other way. And uh, most certainly, I wish, we wish to thank our dear friend, Professor Fernando Valdez Fernandez from the University Autónoma de Madrid, who shouldered the disturbing um, burden of 
organizing uh, with so much energy and joy, as I sense, uh, this event, and an event which no doubt will be very successful. Thank you to all of you from the side of the Ernst Herzfeld Society. Señor Deán de la Catedral, señor alcalde de, de Córdoba, profesor Rita, doctora Francine Guise, yo en realidad me han encargado que presente a la doctora Guise, pero me van a permitir hacer una reflexión porque me da, me da miedo, tengo mucho pudor de hablar en un sitio que ha escuchado las voces de emires, de califas, de reyes de Castilla, de reyes de España. Eh, yo siempre pienso que eh, una forma de, de, de… debe quedar siempre en los monumentos una forma de transmisión eh, espiritual entre quienes están y quienes estuvieron. Y a mí me da mucho pudor hablar donde hablaba Abdarrahman III o al Hakan II o Fernando III de, 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 de León, eh, me, me, un, un arqueólogo de, 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 de quinta categoría, eh, hablando donde hablaron semejantes personajes y, y donde rezaron científicos, eh, científicos no solo islámicos, también, también el Inca Garcilaso, que fue canónigo de esta catedral, es decir, me, me, da, me da mucho pudor, pero lo tengo que decir antes porque realmente eh, yo eh, estoy, estoy francamente, francamente agradecido y, y un poco desbordado, bueno, un poco bastante desbordado, por la amabilidad, por la gentileza, por la acogida que nos ha dado eh, la, la, el Cabildo de la Catedral, el Ayuntamiento de Córdoba, la Asociación de Amigos de Medina Zara, el Museo Arqueológico, la Casa Árabe, eh, lo digo por la colocación, no lo digo por ninguna, por, por ninguna prelación de, de, de importancia. Eh, y, y, por supuesto, por la atención y por la presencia de colegas que han venido de muchas zonas del mundo, unas más cercanas, otras más lejanas, a participar con nosotros estos días de unas jornadas que, como se ha dicho, no tienen conclusiones. Se trata de exponer teorías, comparar conocimientos, hacer contactos y todo congreso, por pequeño que sea, siempre es una pequeña feria en la que los alumnos y los profesores intercambian ideas y alguno pues, hasta puede, puede conseguir abrir el camino para una beca, para una investigación. En fin, de eso se trata y esos son los congresos científicos. No son para que unos especialistas vengan a lucirse como pavos reales. No es esa la historia. Eh, yo voy, eh, dicho esto, que ya es mucho, eh, ya es mucho en extensión, no en calidad, eh, me toca presentar a la doctora Francine Guise, a la que conozco desde hace muchos años, bueno, muchos años, eh, ella era muy joven, yo era un poco menos mayor, eh, porque trabajábamos juntos en la biblioteca del Instituto Arqueológico Alemán de Madrid, eh, en, en una mesa conjunta, Francine siempre muy atenta, muy... Muy, muy centrada en su trabajo y venga a darle a las cúpulas de nervios eh, eh, según el modelo de Córdoba. Y hablábamos, tuvimos la ocasión de hablar eh, mucho tiempo. Eh, Francine eh, terminó su estancia en Madrid, ha seguido una carrera científica que sigue subiendo, eh, ha sido, ha sido eh, profesora eh, en la Universidad de Zúrich, aparte de haberse, haber leído su tesis doctoral y haberse habilitado, y ahora ocupa un puesto muy importante en una institución federal suiza que, dedicada al estudio del vidrio, que se llama Vitro Centre o Vitro Musée Romand. Es decir, eh, ha mantenido una carrera científica estable y, además, una carrera científica que, por lo que se refiere a Córdoba, y este es el principal motivo, aparte de por su currículum, para que la conferencia inaugural la imparta ella, ha mantenido una fidelidad enorme a las investigaciones relacionadas con el, con el arte islámico de la península ibérica, pero también con la historiografía del arte islámico de la península ibérica. Eh, es conocido su libro sobre su recopilación de trabajos sobre eh, neomoris, es decir, lo que nosotros llamaríamos mudéjar y de, de la, la pervivencia de la arquitectura islámica y, por supuesto, el famoso libro sobre las cúpulas de nervios que ya, eh, 
ya es un hito en la historia de la arquitectura de, de Al-Ándalus. Yo no voy a decir nada más porque creo que es mejor escucharla a ella y desde luego mucho mejor que escucharme a mí. Eh, les doy a todos ustedes las gracias. Vuelvo a, dar a, a expresar mi gratitud a las instituciones que nos han acogido, a todas las que están sentadas en la mesa, a las que no están sentadas, porque hay mucha gente detrás de, este, detrás de la organización de este pequeño coloquio. Hay mucha gente que ha trabajado... Eh, el, el, el estudio RIF que nos ha hecho los diseños, eh, en fin, eh, los, los arqueólogos y el equipo que están trabajando eh, en, la, en la excavación del patio, a los que hemos mareado de día y de noche eh, de forma inmisericorde, eh, por supuesto a la Asociación de Amigos de Medina Zara, que con una voluntariedad y una capacidad y un entusiasmo están eh, haciendo prácticamente la infraestructura que maneja, que maneja el Congreso, a los alumnos que han venido desinteresadamente a ayudarnos. Y por eso yo creo que de, primero debo estar muy agradecido y además debo a todos ustedes y además a la doctora Francine Guise, que amablemente y superado el miedo inicial de hablar en la Mezquita de Córdoba, eh, dijo sí eh, a mi insistencia para que nos diese la primera conferencia. Muchas gracias. Bueno, muchas gracias, Fernando. Está, eh, estimado señor Deán, estimado señor alcalde, estimado señor director de Casa Árabe, estimados miembros de la Asociación uh, de los Amigos de Medina Tazara, dear members of the Ernst Herzfeld Society, señoras y señores. Es un gran honor poder inaugurar el coloquio de la Sociedad Ernst Herzfeld para el estudio del arte y la arqueología islámica, islámicos en un lugar tan excepcional como la Mezquita Catedral. Me gustaría agradecer a los organizadores, Fernando Valdés, Carmen González y Ana Zamorano, por haberme invitado eh, a dar la conferencia inaugural. Uno de los principales motivos por los que el coloquio de este año se celebra en Córdoba es la reanudación de las investigaciones arqueológicas en uno de los edificios más emblemáticos de la península ibérica por parte de la Universidad de Córdoba y el Cabildo Catedral de Córdoba. Dentro del proyecto de investigación de, Iure, de Julius César a los Reyes Católicos, análisis arqueológico de 1500 años de historia de la Mezquita Catedral de Córdoba y su entorno urbano, dirigido por Alberto León Muñoz y José Antonio Carrigue Mata de la Universidad de Córdoba, se están reevaluando las excavaciones realizadas por Félix Hernández Jiménez en la Mezquita Catedral para conocer aún mejor la historia de este importante conjunto monumental y su evolución dentro de la ciudad de Córdoba. El proyecto cubre así el tema central del coloquio de ese año, que está dedicado a la transformación de las mezquitas, como mostrarán varias contribuciones de miembros del equipo del proyecto en el transcurso de los próximos dos días. Me alegro mucho formar parte de ese equipo y poder presentarles hoy uno de los subproyectos que están llevando a cabo conjuntamente el Vitro Saint Romo y el Cabildo Catedral de Córdoba. Dicho proyecto está dedicado eh, a un espacio destacado dentro de la Mezquita Catedral, la Capilla Real que está justo al lado, consagrada en 1371 por Enrique II de Trastámara. Más que cualquier otro espacio del edificio, esta capilla funeraria refleja la realidad transcultural y la continuidad artística en la península ibérica durante la Edad Media. Situada al este de la capilla de Villa Viciosa de época Omeya y reutilizado como presbiterio tras la conversión de la mezquita en catedral, la capilla real consta de una cripta inferior y una cámara superior abovedada, cuyas paredes están recubiertas de una rica decoración de alicatados y yeserías que evocan las salas de la Alhambra o del Alcázar de Sevilla, construidas en la misma época. 
Un elemento hasta ahora poco conocido de esta cámara superior son sus vidrieras. Pertenecen a un tipo de ventana muy común en el mundo islámico, compuesta, compuesto por piezas de vidrio coloreado insertadas en una celosía de estuco. Su estudio nos permitirá dar nueva luz no solo sobre la Mezquita Catedral de Córdoba, sino también sobre la arquitectura andalusí y mudéjar en general. Como algunos de los participantes al coloquio han venido de lejos, pasaré ahora al inglés para que todas, eh, todos puedan seguir mis observaciones. Hay eh, traducción simultánea eh, del eh, inglés al español. I would like to begin my talk today with a reference to the reflections of the uh, eponym of our society, the German archaeologist Ernst Herzfeld, regarding the formation of Islamic art, which are still relevant today. In his seminal article, Die Genesis der Islamischen Kunst und das Mshatta Problem, published in the first volume of Der Islam and issued in 1910, Herzfeld explored the question of the origin of the arts of the Islamic world and described the process of artistic formation at the turn of the 7th century as the reuse and reinterpretation of pre-existing building types and modes of expression in a new cultural environment. In a territory previously controlled by the Byzantine Empire, the emergence of a specific Umayyad architecture was the result of an intense cultural and artistic exchange in which the new elites uh, adopted local aesthetics and techniques to create an artistic vocabulary of their own. A similar formation process can be observed in the Abbasid period when monumental Islamic architecture has been reinvented by appropriating elements from the Umayyad repertoire. Thus, while Eva Hoffmann spoke of the uh, representation of continuum in her 2008 re-evaluation of the wall paintings of Samara, previously published by Herzfeld in his 1927 Die Malereien von Samara, the German archaeologist explicitly linked the decorative program of Al Mutawakil's great mosque in Samara to the older Umayyad tradition from Jerusalem and Damascus by stating that, uh, I quote in English, the colorful spolia columns of Syrian mosques were perceived as a standard so that whenever there were no spolia or the columns were ordered and produced ad hoc, like here, or the colossal uh, dimension dimensions led to the use of bundles of columns instead of simple shafts, attempts were undertaken to imitate the colorfulness of the Syrian mosques. This mosque also competed with the Umayyad mosque in Damascus in respect to the glass mosaic decorations of the walls. Many remains thereof have been found so that it has been possible to identify the technique yet not the original patterns." End quote. The existence of cultural and artistic continuities observable in Umayyad and Abbasid architecture can be regarded as one of the essential strategies in the formation process of Islamic art, which was similarly significant for the development of Ibero-Islamic and Mudejar architecture on the Iberian Peninsula. Within this context, the Mosque Cathedral of Córdoba is a major reference for illustrating artistic continuity in medieval Iberia. Founded between 785 and 787 by Abd al-Rahman I and gradually enlarged over two centuries to become one of the biggest mosques of the medieval Islamic world, the Umayyad building can be considered, uh, considered a major reference point in Andalusi architecture. While Abd al-Rahman I's mosque led the foundation for the further enlargements of the building, it was the second prayer hall extension marked in red, executed between 1962 and 1971 under Umayyad Caliph al-Hakam II, which introduced the light motifs of Ibero-Islamic and Mudejar architecture, among them the square or polygonal compartments covered by a star-shaped rib vault and the system of, system of intersecting arches that should later evolve into sepka ornamentation. 
After the reconquest of Cordoba by Fernando III of Castilla and Leon in 1236, the Cordobese mosque was converted into a Christian cathedral. The consecration mass, mass took place on June 30 in Fernando's presence, exactly 786 years ago today. As in Umayyad times, the Al Hakam extension was the liturgical center stage of the newly san sanctified building. Therefore, the Christian presbytery and nave initially were not located in the middle of the former Islamic prayer hall, but in its southwest uh, corner, which was and still is the most important and resplendent part of the mosque. So we are here now in this uh, part. Right here is the prayer niche adorned with a rich mosaic decor and flanked by two similarly designed facades, all three being located within the Maxura. This enclosed compartment in front of the Praeonesian pulpit, distinguished by three star-shaped rip walls, is the culmination point of the broader and higher middle nave. A fourth Umayyad rip wall, marked in red, which is behind us, together with the transversal arcade, was constructed at the beginning of Al Hakam II's middle nave to demarcate the newly built area from the two precedent phases executed by Abd al-Rahman I in the second half of the 8th century and by Abd al-Rahman II in the first uh, half of the 9th. By the 17th century, this first compartment of the middle nave of Al Hakam's prayer hall extension was known as Capilla de Nuestra Señora de Villa Viciosa. After 1236, it was turned into a presbytery covering the adjacent base towards the Puerta del Espíritu Santo in the west into a nave of the Gordobis Cathedral, where the Holy Mass was celebrated until the consecration of the second and much more monumental nave in 1607. A burial chapel known as Capilla Real or Capilla de San Fernando was installed in the second half of the 14th century next to the aforementioned Capilla de Villa Viciosa. Built as a two-storied complex, the floor of the lower vaulted chamber or crypt lays below the floor level of the surrounding ground floor. The upper chamber is situated two meters above floor level. The Capilla Real has a total height of 17 meters. Its base is nearly twice as wide as it is long. According to Isidro Bango Torviso, medieval uh, burial tradition, traditions in Christian Spain witnessed a radical change in the 12th century. While sepulture within churches had formerly been prohibited by the Council of, Council of Braga of 561, a gradual conquest of the church's interior now took place, whereby the presbytery was attributed particular importance. This trend went hand in hand with the general tendency to separate and mark privileged burial chapels within the church, as testified by the cathedrals of Seville, Toledo, and Cordoba, where the royal chapels were constructed ex novo in privileged locations in immediate proximity to the presbytery from the 13th century onwards. The earliest of these constructions was built by Alfonso X. He commissioned the royal burial chapel for his father, Fernando III, deceased in 1252, and his mother, Beatriz de Suabia, who already died in 1235 in the Cathedral of Seville. According to our much esteemed and recently disappeared colleague, Juan Carlos Ruiz Sosa, this was the first privatization of an area in a cathedral through the construction of a burial chapel in its most important sector. Alfonso's commission was not only a novelty, but also the starting point of a new tradition. Royal burials would not take place in monasteries such as Santa Maria la Real de las Huelgas in Burgas, Burgos anymore, but in areas within cathedrals built especially for this purpose. Regrettably, Fernando's civilian burial chapel, with its major importance for typology and formal evolution, was destroyed during the Gothic reconstruction of the cathedral, which started in 1401. Written sources give us at least some clues about the location and the general layout of the chapel. 
According to a description by Espinosa de los Monteros from 1635, the chapel was located in the eastern part of the cathedral, close to the former minaret and thus right next to the presbytery. And just as in, uh, in the Gordobese example, this royal chapel was erected over a vaulted substructure resulting, uh, resulting in a two-storied layout. These two aspects, the proximity to the presbytery and the two-storied uh, construction of the chapel became mandatory for the kings of Castilla and Leon until the beginning of the 15th century, together with the relocation of the royal burial grounds from the monastery to newly built chapels in the cathedral, testified by the chapels of Sancho IV in Toledo and Pedro I in Seville, as well as the chapels built or finished by Enrique II in Cordoba and Toledo. So far, so good. But this is only half the story, because the architectural composition of the upper chamber of the Cordobese chapel is also linked to the so-called cupa, an interior space composed of a square or polygonal compartment covered by a dome. The cupa became a standard element of Nasrid architecture and was adopted for most of the funerary chapels as well as other representative spaces of the crown of Castilla and Leon, such as oratories, royal halls and garden pavilions, mainly in the 14th century. The origin of this type of structure, which has been closely studied by Rafael Manzano Martos, Juan Carlos Ruiz Sosa and more recently Walid Abdelaziz Akef, goes back to ancient architecture and has survived since the beginning of Islam in Umayyad and Abbasid architecture. In Al-Andalus, written sources describe the famous Umayyad Kupa of the Palatine city of Medina da Sara, as well as the one built by Al-Mansur in the since-destroyed city of Al-Zahira on the outskirts of Cordoba. One of the earliest Nasserid examples can be found in the Rabita of San Sebastian in the city of Granada, dated 1218 to 1219. Besides the central compartments uh, of the Alcazar Genil and the Cuarto Real de Santo Domingo in Granada, both from the 13th century, one of the most impressive kebab can be found in the Sala de Comares of the Alhambra, built in the middle of the 14th century. In Cordoba, Two uh, deep polylobed arches, starting from lion consoles at the chapel's northern and southern side, mark the transition from the rectangular floor plan to the nearly square vault base. Above this line rises a dome of 4.35 meters in height, which adopts the very design of the Islamic rib vault of the adjacent Capilla de Villa Viciosa from the second half of the 10th century. In both compartments, eight intersecting ribs start directly from the stone corniche, combining the different rib layouts of the three Mukarna stones. The difference in the respective effect of the neighboring walls is foremost caused by their diverging designs. The massive ribs of the Capilla de Villalciosa are visible and the savories in between hollowed out by means of small-scale rib or melon domes. In contrast, the royal chapel's uh, vault surface is overlaid with a rich Mukarna's decor, which used to be gilded, thereby replacing the star-shaped rib vault as a marker of sacrality by a Mukarna dome, an architectural element that, according to Ruiz Sosa, originally had similar connotations. In fact, we can observe a, a deliberate choice of exactly this vaulting type for Castilian royal burial sites, a trend that culminated in the reuse of a Nasrid Mukarna's dome for the original resting place of the Catholic kings Isabel I of Castile and Fernando II of Aragon at uh, the Palacio de los Infantes, former monastery of San Francisco in the Alhambra. In contrast to this Nasrid vault, the dome of the Cordobese burial chapel adopts local architectural forms, resulting in a unique combination of ribbed and Mukarna's vaults, emulating the Umayyad vault in the adjacent Capilla de Villa Viciosa and translating it into the visual language of the 14th century. 
Just like the dome, the wall zone below is decorated in its upper section with a continuous, originally polychromatic stucco decor, which is characterized by a combination of floral ornamentation, Arab inscriptions, and coat of arms, referring to the crown of Castilla and Leon. The lower wall sections, or dado, are adorned by a geometric tile mosaic. Both the stucco and tile work follow an Islamic vocabulary known from Nasrid architecture and thus date from the 14th century. The superposition of different artistic traditions is especially apparent in these lower wall areas. Here, the central part of the eastern wall is occupied by an elaborate Mukarna's niche, sheltering an 18th century sculpture of Fernando III, whereas the western wall holds a dedicatory inscription preserved in situ. <clears throat> the inscription was initially surrounded by a wall painting of a king, probably the donor, which did not survive and is only mentioned in a text dating 1617. The inscription in Gothic lectures speaks of Castilian king Enrique II of Trastamara, who translocated the remains of his father, Alfonso XI, from the Cathedral of Seville to Cordoba in 1371, in order to bury him next to his father and Enrique's grandfather, Fernando IV, resting in Cordoba since 1312. In their recently published contribution on the Royal Chapel, Concepcion Abad Castro and Ignacio González Cavero questioned this attribution and argued that the design of the upper chamber may go back to Pedro I, the Castilian king, closely related to the Nasrid court of Muhammad V, included kebab in many of his buildings, among them the spectacular Sala de los Embajadores in the Alcázar of Seville. As shown so far, there are various elements that connect the Royal Chapel of Cordoba with the artistic repertoires of the Crown of Castilla and León and Nasrid Granada, thereby bearing witness of a transcultural reality which influenced not only palace architecture, but also penetrated the religious realm through royal commissions within cathedrals. Scholars have been arguing for more than 100 years about the origin uh, and the art historical classification of the chapel, which is one of the most debated spaces within the Cordobese Mosque Cathedral. While Dionisio Ortiz Juarez and Juan Carlos Ruiz Sousa argued for an Islamic origin, the majority of scholars consider the chapel to be a Christian construction of the 14th century. We encountered the same problem of classification with the upper chamber's rich decorative program, which according to Maria Angeles Jordano Barbudo refers in its lower part to Christian and Sephardi buildings of the 14th century in Toledo and Seville, among them the synagogue of Samuel Halevi and the palace of Pedro I in the Alcázar of Seville, while the stucco decoration in the upper zone points to Nasrid Granada. Moreover, uh, Jordano Barbuda was, Barbudo was able to establish a formal relationship with the stucco work of the palace complex of the Cordoba family in Esija, today the convent of the Teresas. These assignments were made largely on the basis of written sources, structural evidence, and formal analysis. What is still missing today is reliable data that corroborates these observations. This is the goal of the recently launched research project, the Royal Chapel of Cordoba Revisited, Stucco Glass Windows in Medieval Iberia. Jointly conducted by the Vitro Centre Romain and the Cathedral Chapter of Cordoba, the study forms part of the already mentioned project De Jure de Julio César a los Reyes Católicos, led by Alberto León Muñoz and José Antonio Gariguet Mata from the University of Cordoba. In the center of the mentioned sub-project, undertaken by Sophie Wolf, Sara Keller, Raimundo Ortiz Urbano, Rafael Ortiz Cordero and myself, stands the just described upper chamber of the Capilla Real. One of its uh, still largely unknown elements are the colorful stucco glass windows discovered in the course of diagnostic and archaeological investigations undertaken in order to prepare the restoration of the chapel. Only two of initially 16 windows lo um, located below the chapel's dome are partially preserved. 
Uh, today, they are hidden behind a layer of brick or masonry and covered by painted plaster, which reproduces the leaded lights installed in the 16th or 17th century on the northern, eastern, and southern side of the chapel to incre increase the luminosity of the interior space. So what you see here, um, uh, I, where you see the glass, the, this frag this, uh, fragments of uh, the window, it's the outer side and you have the inner side uh, with the plaster surface. The present windows are characterized by a geometric lead tracery mainly used in the 17th and 18th century. Thus, the preliminary investigations come to different conclusions regarding the alteration of the original fenestration. The exact date of removal or breaking up of the stucco glass windows and the installation of the leaded lights will have to be determined in the course of the project. The 14th century Gordobes windows are a characteristic element of the mentioned kebab and the only surviving elements for stucco glass windows in situ in Al-Andalus so far. The colored sheet glass fragments that have been found during excavations in Ciudad de Vasco in the province of Toledo, as well as in Murcia or Granada, are evidence for such windows, but not a single stucco glass window has been preserved in these places. The discovery at the Mosque Cathedral of Cordoba sheds new light not only on one of the most important and sumptuous examples of Mudejar architecture in Spain, but also on Islamic buildings such as the Nasrid uh, Kebab of Granada mentioned before. Therefore, the Gortobis windows are of outstanding importance for what Jorge de Juan Ares and Nadine Chibille called a fragmented history, una historia fragmentada in 2020, with respect to our knowledge of glass art in Al-Andalus. This history is especially fragmental when it comes to stucco glass windows. They are still a largely unstudied subject of Islamic architecture in general. The only existing survey on stucco glass windows to date is Barry Flood's unpublished PhD dissertation Palaces of Crystal, Sanctuaries of Light, Windows, Jewels and Glass in Medieval Islamic Architecture from 1993. The author studied an impressive number of medieval examples from all regions of the Islamic world and herewith laid the foundations for the terminology and typological classification of Islamic stucco glass windows. According to Flood, there are two groups of medieval windows. On the one hand, Kamariyat, documented in the Near East and Egypt, and on the other, Shamsiyat, common in North Africa and Al-Andalus. While Kamariyat are characterized by both ornamental and figurative compositions, including flower stems or bouquets, cypress and palm trees, architectural or animal representations, Shamsiyat feature purely uh, geometric decoration. All in all, Flood's work is extremely valuable to our knowledge of Islamic stucco glass windows, but it also raises the problem of dating. It is often impossible to judge whether the windows preserved in situ are original or if they, have, um, uh, the, if they are more recent replicas. Furthermore, the study uh, leaves important questions concerning the origin and the production technique of the glass unanswered or treats them in a summary manner. No laboratory analysis have been conducted. More recently, Danielle Foy has done research on the topic. However, she did not include stucco glass windows from the Iberian Peninsula. Given the limited number of finds of Andalusi window glass, which were so far all discovered in archaeological excavations, we know only little about the characteristics and the use of architectural glass on the Iberian Peninsula. To date, there are only a few contributions on Ibero-Islamic windows by Leopoldo Torres Balbas, Antonio Fernandez Puertas, or more uh, recently, Purificación Marineto Sanchez and Isabel Cambil Campaña. New data on the material characteristics of Islamic stucco glass windows are expected from the SNSF project Luminosity of the East, conducted by the Vitro Centre Romand since uh, 2020. The ongoing project has laid the foundations for the present project, 
by providing a scientific inventory of, the com of a comprehensive corpus of Islamic stucco glass windows from various museum collections. The inventory includes data regarding the typology, the chronology, and the origin of the windows. The research also provides first-hand information on the materials and techniques used to produce these windows and on the art historical and technical development of this art form. A more detailed study on the colored glass, its production technique and composition is ongoing. The making of these windows, which consist of colored glass pieces set in stucco grills and either sandwiched between two transenne or attached to the back of a stucco grill by means of a thin layer of plaster, follows a long tradition within the Islamic world. Stucco glass windows are attested since the Umayyad period. However, it is still difficult to determine the exact date of the window windows in some of the most enigmatic monuments, among them the Dome of the Rock in Jerusalem. Therefore, apart from studying the formal aspects and typology of stucco glass windows, it is of crucial importance to characterize the used glass as a recent archaeometrical study of glass tessera and window glass fragments found in Al-Walid I's first early 8th century palatial residence of Khirbat al minya has shown. The material characterization of the preserved glass, which was conducted by Laura Ware Adlington, Marcus Ritter, and Nadine Schibille, has brought to light new information on the production, the composition, and the provenance of glass in the Levantine region during the early Islamic period. On the basis of the results obtained, the authors were able to show that in the early 8th century, the supply of sheet glass came mainly from Egypt and no longer relied exclusively on the local raw glass industry in the Syro-Palestinian uh, area. In the case of the Gortabis uh, Shamsiat, the examinations so far undertaken by the research team have shown that the majority of the glass pieces used in the 14th century windows have been cut from crown glass. The production of this type of sheet glass is attested in the Near East since the Justinian period. The findings from Istabl Antar in Fustat, Egypt, and Sabr al Mansuria, Tunisia, attests that its use prevailed during the Middle Ages across the Islamic world. According to Daniel Foy, the findings from Sabra al Mansuria even suggest that the window glass used during the last phase of occupation of the ancient Fatimid capital came from a local workshop which produced colored crown glass with diameters ranging between 30 and 40 centimeters in turquoise blue, amber, and purple. The earliest surviving window glass on the Iberian Peninsula dates from the second quarter of the 13th century. It has been found in the Thespit Pozo Negro of the Bux Marina House, the so-called Casón de Bux Marina near the parish of San Nicola, Nicolás in Murcia. The archaeologist Pedro Jiménez Castillo, together with Julio Navarro Palazón and Jacques Tiro, have discovered and analyzed these finds, which include pieces of sheet glass in different colors, some of them with traces of cold pa paint, a technique that has been used in the Islamic world since, since the mid-8th century, with documented examples from Qasr al khair al-Garbi or Khirbat al-Mafjar. As in Fustat, Sabr al Mansuria, or Cordova, the glass pieces from Murcia were cut out of crown glass and fitted in the openings of the stucco grill of Shamsiat. The excavations on the site of the Bux Marina house have also confirmed the production of raw glass in Murcia, which was mentioned by the 13th century Andalusi geographer, historian, and poet Ibn Said al Maghribi. Pedro Jiménez Castillo and his team could identify a glass workshop, B, with an approximately rectangular surface area of 16 to 9.8 meters. The archaeological findings indicate a long period of use of the workshop. A total of eight furnaces could be identified in the most region, uh, uh, recent occupation phase, although only five of them seem to have been in use during that period. Out of the five, the furnaces four and one, first phase, have been used for raw glass production. 
Cordoba was another early center of raw glass production in Al-Andalus as the excavations of the southern suburb of the city located across the river and known as Ravada Shakunda have shown. Despite a limited period of use, the archaeological remains of the suburb found it ex novo in around 750 and destroyed in 818 by Al-Hakam I after a revolt of its population, provide valuable clues about the urban development of Cordoba during the early Emirate period. Moreover, and most relevant for our current project, a research team led by Nadine Shibille and Jorge de Juan Ares was able to trace the origins of Cordoba's glassmaking industry in Jacunda. In a period when the supply of raw glass from the production centers of the, on the Levantine coast and in Egypt decreased significantly, the exploitation of local raw materials, among them the lead slags from the silver and lead mining in the region around Cordoba, resulted in the production of high lead glasses. The analysis of 9th to 12th century Islamic glass samples from Cordoba, conducted by Chloe Duckworth at Alii, has shown that high lead glass persisted in the residential area of the city suburbs even after the destruction of Shakunda. The chemical characterization of the 14th century glass used in the Royal Chapel of Cordoba's Mosque Cathedral undertaken within the mentioned project will provide data that should help us to answer questions concerning its origin and in particular the question whether the glass was made locally or imported, imported from either Christian or other Islamic glass production cent centers on the Iberian Peninsula. If the glass used for the Gordobis Shamsiyat has a high lead composition, it would also prove that uh, there was still a local glass making industry in Gordoba producing high lead glass in post Islamic times. In a second step, it will be necessary to clarify whether conclusions can also be made about the origin of the windows as a whole. Were the Stuco Transenna produced locally or were they imported from one of the cultural centers of the time, either Granada, Seville or Toledo? Can the used Stucco provide us with further clues here, especially when compared, compared to the mineralogical and chemical composition of the 27 samples taken from the Stucco work of the chapel and analyzed in the course of the diagnostic investigation mentioned above? Only if we analyze layer by layer and genera generate reliable da data as to their material composition, we will be able to decode the entangled architecture of medieval Iberia. I'm finishing. Through the juxtaposition of Umayyad prototypes of the 10th century, a contemporary Nasri decor and a Christian architectural context, the Royal Chapel has become a key reference for studying the artistic continuity within the Mosque Cathedral of Cordoba and beyond. By using a language of signs and symbols based on visual codes which point to the crown of Castilla and Leon and to Nasrit Granada, the Royal Chapel of Cordoba stands for a common artistic legacy charged with new meaning and therefore refers directly to Herzfeld's initially mentioned interpretation of the formation of Islamic art. In this sense, Herzfeld's observations do not only apply to the Islamic world, but, have, uh, but also have validity beyond it. As research on the past decades has shown, Dealing with artistic manifestations that cross different cultural spheres challenge traditional art historiography. New approaches are needed to close the gaps and open new ways of understanding. By placing materiality at the center of our investigation, we want to take such a new path in our research project. The expected results should help us to obtain a complete picture of Cordoba's royal chapel in which the hitherto unstudied windows are also taken into account. Hence, as emphasized by Isabel Campil Campagna regarding the Nasrit glass fragments found in the Alhambra, 
Shamsiat must have been part of a decorative unity, una unidad decorativa, formed by the ceramic dado, the stucco work, and the ceilings or domes. This must also have been the case in Cordoba, where the transenna of the two preserved windows on the western side of the Capilla Real is based on a six-pointed star design, echoing the ornamental composition of the ceramic dado. Reconstructing the decorative unity of this upper chamber will not only shed light on this important space within the Mosque Cathedral of Cordoba, but also allow conclusions about Nasrit Kibab and their original fenestration. Despite the fact that today hardly any material traces of Shamsiyat have survived in Al-Andalus in situ, the colorful windows have left a lasting trace in Andalusi poetry. I therefore would like to close my lecture by quoting a Panegyri Kasida by Ibn al-Jayab, the other poet of the Alhambra, as he was called by Maria Jesus Rubiera Mata, who dedicated her PhD thesis, first published in, 18, uh, in 1982 and re-edited in 94, to his life and work. When describing the various building projects of Muhammad III, Ibn al-Jayab mentions also the kuppa of a palace constructed by the Nasrid Emir uh, in the Rabad al-Najd on the banks of the Khenil. In his descriptions, he especially emphasizes its colorful stucco glass windows. I quote in English translation, your kuppa is like a bride making herself up with seductive beauty at her wedding and the sun adorns behind her glass splendid dresses in all colors. Thank you very much. Gracias a todos. Eh, después de esta primera conferencia queda ya inaugurado eh, este congreso, que esperemos que sea fructífero para todos y que podamos adquirir esa sabiduría que necesitamos para luego poder respetar y conservar esta belleza. Muchísimas gracias a todos.